Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. Good to be back. I haven't done one of these since before the pandemic. Um, no less an authority than Thomas Jefferson uh, recommended that we tear up any existing constitution and redraft it every 19 years. So by his count, we're 214 years overdue. Um, according to emails I periodically receive from Common Cause, if only a few more states join the call, we could face an Article 5 constitutional convention something I don't think I even knew existed until I read one of those emails. And while some might see this as an opportunity to correct some flaws, like to uh, get rid of the Electoral College, for example, the prospect scares the hell out of me and both of my guests, <laughs> who together have written the book we see, The Constitution in Jeopardy. Um, the subtitle is An Unprecedented Effort to Rewrite Our Fundamental Law and What We Can Do About It, now, personally, I feel we need to heal an awful lot of tribalism and misinformation before I want to trust us with a constitutional convention. And even if we could effectively and constructively achieve sufficient education among the people, which seems an enormous challenge, we'd still have to contend with all the political, media, and big money, big corporate influences on the execution of such a convention. Russ Feingold has said, Although our Constitution is by no means perfect, it continues to suffer from founding failures and has contributed to inequity across the country. There is a conversation to be had about the Constitution, but not the one we're going to talk about tonight. I look forward to this conversation to answer a number of questions, including what is an Article 5 Constitutional Convention? How real is the possibility? Am I right to be scared? And what can we do about it? You've already uh, been introduced to uh, Russ Feingold and Peter Prinville, so let me ask, I like people to get a feel for the people that we talk about. So I got a couple of non-book, <laughs> non-constitution questions for you. Peter, briefly, what was your path from teaching high school to constitutional <laughs> law? Uh, well, after I, I graduated from college, I, I spent two years in southern Mississippi teaching high school. Uh, I taught uh, civics and history. Uh, and it was a, an absolutely wonderful experience and uh, you know, a wonderful way to start my career, but I'd always felt called to the law, uh, and so it was always on the horizon, and, and so I, I made a, a, a bit of a career pivot early on, but uh, uh, one that I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying a great deal. Okay, so. and I would imagine actually that that experience enriches and, and, you know, Undoubtedly. contributes to what you've done since rather than vaulting right into competitive law school and <laughs> never meeting a citizen. <laughs> of course, and I think it, it, it's something that really came out in the, in the process of, of writing the book. You know, there was a lot of marrying all these different interests. Now, Russ, as Ted said, you and a prominent Republican, John McCain in this case, could actually sponsor together and get passed a bill to limit Finance, campaign finance. Can you reflect just a bit on how things have changed? Well, it's not a pretty picture, is it? Um, we had a, kind of a tradition in the Senate where people tried to work with other members of the other party. It was both fun and appropriate and actually made people happy back home. Uh, so, you know, it was all good. Uh, and this sort of changed violently in 2008, 2009 when the uh, Tea Party came along and they started attacking Republicans who would work with other people. I remember uh, mentioning at a town meeting where people were giving me a hard time uh, 
Now, Lindsey Graham was working with John Kerry on a climate bill, and they started booing. They said, You're a, he's a rhino. That means a Republican in name only. And this was only the beginning of this dismantling of bipartisanism, which has to change. But you know, there are little ra rays of hope. Look what Liz Cheney is doing. Look at that committee. Republicans and Democrats together taking on one of the toughest investigations in American history. So there's a, a tiny ray of hope at a time that feels pretty rough for bipartisanship. Yeah, yeah. So how did this book happen? Well, um, you know, uh, the people of Wisconsin treated me very well, but they did give me my gold watch in 2010, <laughs> and I needed a job. And so, fortunately, the dean of the Marquette University Law School sent me a note, even though he was a conser conservative, a clerk for Justice Scalia, and he said, why don't you come over to the law school and teach? And I said, all right, I've never done that before, but he suggested that I teach a course about basically the law of the United States Senate, sort of looking at the Constitution through the lens of the Senate, you know, the filibuster and the presidential powers, war powers, all those kinds of things. And as time went on, as I taught the course at various universities, I started thinking about the fact that one of the things members of Congress have to do is to consider, or they should consider, whether something they're voting on is constitutional. And do they do that? I also thought about the fact that once in a while, uh, members of Congress get the opportunity to vote on whether or not they want to send a constitutional amendment to the people. And that only happened a few times when I was there. But it was a big moment. I, and then it finally got me to think about just the way we amend the Constitution itself. And this is Article 5. And I created the first course we think in the country, a seminar uh, that said, you know, what, what are the ways we can change the Constitution? What's the history of it? Why is it that it's so hard to do? And then finally I got to go to Stanford uh, Law School, wonderful place to teach. And uh, I had a great class, mostly of first-year students. On this subject? On this subject, on amending the Constitution. And uh, one of the students was particularly good, and then I asked him to become my teaching assistant, and he was tremendous at that. We had to teach the last one during COVID from distance. But at the end, he said to me, Russ, you can't just let this sit. This stuff about a possible convention being called by the right wing needs to be discussed, as well as the general subject. And so I said, look, I just became president of the American Constitution Society. I can't do it by myself. I, you got to do it with me. And so that's this guy, Peter Prindeville. Excellent. Great story. Was that the moment that you knew you had to write this when he said you've got to write it? Or was there some event that happened that just said, I got to stop thinking about it? And no, it was his realization that this is something that wasn't, you know, my original purpose was to simply add to scholarship on this and get people to understand it and think about it, uh, which, you know, is an important thing in our society. But it took Peter to say, this message has to get out more broadly, and that's why we wrote the book. And your purpose was exactly that, to get it out there, to get the conversation started? I'll let Peter answer that, because I think he has some good thoughts. Of course, on yeah. I mean, this is an this is such a foundational question. How is it that a sovereign people changes the legal order, the political order? And uh, it, it's a topic that should be, should be debated and discussed in civic circles, around the dinner table. And so we wanted to write a book that was accessible for non-lawyers. You know, much of the writing in this area is for lawyers. You know, it's a legal scholarship. And so we wanted to, uh, provide something that was kind of an entree for people to begin thinking both about the dangers of Article 5 and the, and the potential troubles it presents, but also about the, the fundamental importance of constitutional change. Uh, we have the, the world's oldest functioning written national constitution, but it's also one of, the, the, it is the least changed, which we argue really poses some existential problems for a modern society. Also, in the history, you point out it was the first written constitution that had amendment in it that, that actually pr proposed that it could be changed, and yet... <laughs> well, the, the first not premised on unanimity. So the Articles of Confederation, right. of course, had an amendment provision, but it was incredibly flawed because it required absolute unanimity. Well, I mean, there was uh, many attempts. The Articles of Confederation, despite some, some popular uh, today people want to go back to it, but I mean, it <laughs> failed miserably. I mean, the first 10 years of the country, we were awash in debt, we couldn't, we couldn't muster an army. Uh, 
And there were many calls for reform, and they all failed because there was one state or another who said no. Usually Rhode Island. Usually Rhode yeah. Island. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the little one picking on everybody else. Yeah, and they were the la they, they, they were holdouts on the, the actual Constitution. It took them years to actually ratify the thing. So. But, so, okay, so, so it was the first one to actually provide that the citizens could in some way change this Constitution and yet the paradox is, as you point out, the least changed. So let's start with that. Why has it, and, and if we, we you know, there, there are 27, and 10 of them were passed as the Bill of Rights quite soon after. So really, what did I say, 200 and, That's right. I think it's 233 years since the Constitutional Convention, mm -hmm. and we've passed 17. Why is it so hard, and what does that, what does that do to us? Well, first of all, let's be clear about there are two ways to amend the Constitution in Article 5. The one that most of us knew about, or I didn't know much about this other way either, uh, is, you know, the Congress can pass a Constitution or begin the process of passing constitutional amendments if two-thirds of the members of both houses vote on the exact same language, and then that is sent out to the states for ratification, either by means of a convention or by the vote of the state legislature. But it's only happened 17 times since the Bill of Rights because that's a very hard barrier to get through. First, you gotta get through the two thirds and then of course the three quarters. So it's very difficult and it's considered by political scientists to be the hardest one in the world. Although it has happened and we discuss what movements and events can cause that to happen. The other one though is, it was just as much in that Article 5 as the other one. And that is that if two thirds of the states simply apply to Congress, send an application through their legislatures for a convention, the Congress is required to call the convention. It's not like they have a debate and say, well, we got two thirds of the state that wanna do this, what do you think? No, that, it is required. And this is what the far right has figured out. Using gerrymandered state legislatures, they are trying to reach the point where as soon as January, although it may not be that soon, they could try to have this convention called. There has never been one before. It's come close. It's come within one state a couple times. But we are on the verge of this, and but people say, you know, don't you think we have enough to worry about already? <laughs> but what's the point of not understanding? And frankly, even Steve Bannon now is, is well, taking this as a major point of his cause. And one thing you point out, the reason maybe that unless you've been getting those emails from Common Cause, you probably haven't heard That's about right. this, is that while holding a convention, if it were, you know, hugely uh, announced to the country, transparent, inclusive would be one thing, they've been pretty quiet about this. There's a great uh, anecdote. You know, one of the previous efforts that tried to call one of these conventions was during the 80s to call a convention to deal with a balanced budget amendment issue. We have this great anecdote in the book about uh, one of the advocates got a little, he was, he was frustrated because as the movement got closer and closer to success, uh, people started to actually realize the full power of such a, this convening. And you know, the cat got out of the bag and he said, we should have just kept it a little quieter, you know, gotten up to the threshold where you can't really get back anymore. And so there's, that was clearly a lesson that was learned on the right, to, to keep it hush. Um, he said that the funny quote is that uh, they wanted to convince state legislators that these applications for convention were as meaningful and as powerful as a resolution endorsing apple pie. Wow. And that was, their, that was the strategy, and it failed miserably. And so uh, we argue in the book that there's been some learning. Uh, there's been a number of attempts starting in the 60s that was a yeah. surprise to me too. I thought that you know part of the, the the premise of the book was going to be that this has never happened, and it has never happened. But it hasn't never been tried. Right. Well, I mean, there have been some times it was tried that that I think led to good results. You know, uh, in in the progressive era, uh, there was a movement started in Nebraska to have uh, the direct election of senators instead of the uh, legislatures picking them. Of course, there was a movement for uh, um, allowing the income tax. That required uh, repeat, uh, overcoming the Supreme Court's prohibition on the income tax. There was a movement to have women vote. And all of these things were the subject of applications. 
they never quite got the, the two-thirds that were required, but it got so close, particularly with regard to the direct election of senators, that the Senate said, all right, we'll, we'll do it. And that was the 17th Amendment. So there was a period, after a long period of no amendments at all, where a rush of those occurred, and that was more from the progressive side. However, the story that we tell in the book, two close calls from the more conservative side, not necessarily as dangerous as what we're looking at here, but maybe, Peter, you'd say a word about those so, efforts. So the first was during the 60s, Senator Dirksen of Illinois uh, led a movement to try and get a, call a convention to overturn some of the Supreme Court's uh, rulings about apportionment, the side, how district lines are drawn for state legislatures that really frustrated um, a lot of state legislators, you can imagine, so it was kind of a niche issue. Um, that failed by one vote, uh, and but then you know the dream really didn't die. Again, in the 80s, spurred a lot by the uh, property tax revolt here in California, um, and the use of initiatives and constitutional amendments and ballot initiatives here in California to rein in tax uh, taxation. Uh, people said, well, why don't we try and translate this California experience to the national level, uh, and started passing amendments again, uh, and that also kind of fizzled. Uh, due in large part to the, the same arguments and concerns we raise in the book. You know, the, the, many of the arguments we make are, aren't new. They, they, they were made in the 60s, they were made in the 80s, and they're being made again today. And, and that's partially why we end the book where we do, talking about reform. Uh, you know, we need to answer some of these questions. And Peter and I think it's important that people not regard this as some kind of illegitimate scheme. A lot of what the right's trying to do is, obviously, January 6th, the way they stole the Supreme Court, uh, this, this independent state legislature theory where they're claiming that the state legislature can disregard the vote in a state if they feel like it. This is a legal mechanism, but that doesn't A legitimate mean, legal it's, mechanism. It's completely exactly. legitimate, but it is a very bad idea right now. So well, just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's uh, something that people should want to do. We should say that the, the mechanism is legitimate, yes, we've got to be careful but the way that. in which it's being reimagined and all of, there's an array of unanswered legal questions about how this thing actually functions and what, how new, th this movement is divining new, new answers really from thin air. That's not legitimate, but the right. process is. You, you point out that there are two jeopardies of a convention. One is the fact that there are almost no rules set out in the Constitution. You can expand on that. And so chaos constitutional crisis because there's no rules. So it seems to me, yeah, the closer we get to it happening, the more people start to look and go, wait a minute. But the second jeopardy is that the right finesses it and passes some horrible things. So talk about how you view those two. So, so just to, we say that the two jeopardies, one is this contemporary threat, and the second is the fact that Article Five needs some work, that uh, the Constitution should uh, it should be easier to change the Constitution, and we need to answer some of these questions. So the, to the first jeopardy, um, the real danger, as you said, is the fact that there are no rules about how a convening under Article V actually functions in practice. Uh, James Madison, uh, his notes from the 1787 convention are generally considered to be kind of the leading account of what occurred in Philadelphia during the drafting of the Constitution. He remarked that, uh, it's fascinating, he remarked that this Article V process was flawed. He wrote this arguably contemporaneously, although some scholars dispute that, uh, because there were insufficient, quote, constitutional regulations as to quorum and form, which today we would say aren't any rules about how this thing actually functions. And in this vast void have rushed all these new theories of Article V and we argue really of the Constitution itself. Prime of, prime of these is that the, the right now has reimagined, they really starting in 2010, that Article 5 provides not a convention of people, it's not we the people that change the Constitution, it's the states. They've imported an Articles of Confederation understanding of constitutional power and tried to say, well, the states made the federal government and thus the states can change it. That's a theory completely anathema to our, our constitutional history, and it's, a, it's new. I mean, it really was posited within the last two yeah, years. Yeah, I can see you, I think, I want to read a bit about I want to make this concrete for people. Yeah, let me just, let me just piggyback on, on what Peter said so pe make sure people get it. 
you know that the right uh, with Frank Luntz et al. is great at phrasing and word choice and so on, and so they actually will talk about this as a convention of the states, which, I mean, it's that literal, that that's right. the way they talk about it now, which of course it is not. Well, and, and it's fascinating. We, we did some research on this. This has become the term of choice. It, it's being uttered in state houses. It's being used in official legislative instruments, official instruments of, of, of the legislature. It's a completely fictitious term, but it, it embodied in the phrase is a whole new theory of really who we are as a people. Uh, and it's quite dangerous. And that's one of the many reasons why we wanted to write the book is this new theory of constitutional power needs to be checked. Yeah, otherwise it would start, we the states, in order to that's form right. exactly yes, right. go Which ahead. is how the article Well, that's the, point, that's the point right there. The Constitution begins with we the people. And if you look at Article 5, as Peter just perfectly described, it doesn't say anything about a convention of states. So this part is, of this is a scam. And so what are they actually trying to do? I want people to realize exactly that they are preparing very carefully how to do this. If you read nothing else in the book, read Chapter 5, what Trump and the Tea Party couldn't do. Those are th their words. And Senator Rick Santorum, a former colleague of mine in the Senate, said we're planning on putting resources, <clears throat> people in place to get us to where the safety's off and we have a live weapon in our hand. And they've been practicing for years. In September 2016, over 100 state legislators from all 50 states gathered in Williamsburg, Virginia for a constitutional war game. The enemy, the federal government. The warriors, a who's who of the hard right establishment. The battlefield, Article 5. Now, they did have a guy dress up in a video as George Washington, and some people made fun of that. But, you know, it was kind of a serious thing. They are way ahead of the game. They war game the whole scenario, and we write... Even to a casual observer, the debate would have been impressive. Delegates, the vast majority of whom were conservative Republicans, aligned with the Tea Party movement, approached the affair seriously and engaged in good faith debate. They debated, they had, did amendments, they came back and forth, and then they voted. But when they voted, the point that Peter made, they didn't vote as a group, they voted one vote per state. And you know what that means in an era of malapportionment. And, what do they want to do? Well, we right, right. Now, I think we don't have to guess. That's right. In it's, other words, if you want to know it, what it, they do if I they mean, could, they this will mock do, convention. I think eventually they would try to ban abortion and gay marriage and so on. But here is what they are already telling us they're going to do: a hard right constitutional wish list. Proposed amendments would radically transform our modern government, restricting Congress's lawmaking authority to a tiny fraction of its current extent. Think about what we could have done about COVID; wouldn't have been much. Restricting federal agencies' rulemaking authority. What do you think the EPA would be able to do on climate change and clean water? Nothing. Repealing the income tax and their favorite, reminds me of John C. Calhoun and nullification. They have a provision that says if 30 state legislatures, not the governor, not you folks voting popularly, if 30 state legislators don't want to simply overturn an act of Congress or a regulation, that's all it takes. This is what they want to do. And that's why, if you're scared a little bit, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> a convention does not ratify. So I think that's the one thing I think we left out. Right. What is the process in terms that's of... Right. Sure. So Article 5 provides, uh, there's a two-step process for a, for a constitutional amendment. First, the amendment has to be proposed, and then it's ratified. There's, as Russ said before, two methods to propose. Congress can do it, or this convention could do it. But then it's sent to the people of the states for ratification. It requires three quarters of the states. Ratification can occur in one of two ways. There's kind of, the framers thought of it as there's one of two places where the people can speak. One is through a state <coughs> legislature. Ratification can occur there. Or ratification can occur through a state ratifying convention, which has happened only once. It's actually the method that we use to repeal prohibition. People There's were in an a interesting hurry. Interesting story there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? People were in a hurry to repeal <laughs> prohibition, so they went to the conventions. <laughs> yeah, but it requires three quarters, which we admit is a very high bar. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh," and people say, "Oh, Article Five, it really, it's not that powerful." You know, the the thresholds are so high, why bother? And we argue that that you need to watch this more carefully. Uh, that amendments can stay. Uh, can stay dormant for over a century. 
That's the lived experience of the 27th Amendment. It was proposed in 1789 with the original Bill of Rights, but was ratified in 1992. So, I mean, these are talk about generational concerns. Let me ask you guys a question then, uh, which is about the uh, Equal Rights Amendment. Why um, do people claim that it has, that the time for uh, ratifying it has lapsed? Well, I don't think that's right, but it, it is the general understanding because Congress did, and this is something that actually happened around prohibition, they started to put time limits in Congress on how long an amendment could be around. Um, and uh, my view is that that's unconstitutional unless you put it in the language of the amendment itself. Or so, in article, or you amended Article 5. Right, right. <laughs> sure, but, if, yeah. but if it's in the actual language when the legislature votes, that's one thing. So, you know, I was just speaking, speaking to some leaders on this today in Los Angeles. Um, we take the view that the requisite number of states, 38, have uh, ratified it with Virginia and that the president should publish the amendment, should publish the Constitution with it. Of course, that would be challenged. Um, some think it's best to have Congress simply remove the language that, that's there right now having a time limit that would make it easier. Uh, but this is, as Peter just said, this is not only around as something that can be ratified, it can be around as ratified. In other words, mm. at some point, people would argue, and for those of you like me who are pro-choice and outraged by the Dobbs decision, people are now including the uh, legitimacy of the ERA and the Constitution in legal briefs, saying that this can't be done because the ERA is now part of the Constitution. So th this isn't about oh. our convention concern. This is about a congressionally passed thing. I think just a, the, the interesting thing about the ERA, and you know, we can debate whether or not it's actually ratified, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's just a simple example of how Article 5 needs some reform. It's pretty remarkable to think that it's an open question whether or not a sovereign people has amended their governing charter. It's pretty bizarre. And it's even more bizarre to think that that's a question that can be litigated and that must be litigated. I mean, constitutional amendment should be, you know, the purest manifestation of popular rule. And it's the people just, it, it's the rallying cry of the Declaration of Independence that it's the right of the people to change their governing order. And that's why we, we argue in the book that we need to really revisit a lot of these procedural questions. I want you to expand on that just a little, because one of the things I was struck by is I quoted Jefferson's uh, recommendation, a, a new constitution every 19 years, but Washington, um, who, as I, I learned, you know, some side things in this one too, that he was reluctant to even attend the Constitutional Convention, and then when he gets there, they elect him <laughs> president of it, but he had some things to say about why he wasn't willing to sign. It's a fascinating story, and we actually call this Washington's Middle Way. It's kind of a, a framing tool we use for the, for the book because, you know, Washington in the 1780s, he'd, he'd resigned from public life. Uh, he was, you know, went back to his farm on the Potomac and really didn't want to have anything to do with national government. And he was so concerned. There were these, uh, some uprisings in Massachusetts, the Shays Rebellion, where it looked quite clear that the government might fail, that this new experiment, less than a decade old, was doomed for failure. And there's these fascinating letters that we quote in the book, but this is really, it was deeply unnerving to Washington. And so people said, well, the root cause is this Articles of Confederation, it's really broken. They, we can't deal with any of these problems. And so he goes to this convention, he really, James Madison kind of turn, you know, turns his arm to get him to go, he said that he doubted the convention's legality. I like that. Fascinating question when you think about Article 5 today, just the uncertainty around these kinds of constitutional convenings when there aren't enough rules. Uh, he's elected president because, you know, he's, he was a the war general. And many historians argue that if he hadn't gone, the convention probably would have fizzled. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have drafted a new document, and the country could have failed. And so... He, at the end of the convention, he says, the Constitution as drafted was flawed. He said the work of that convention in 1787 had problems. But he encouraged the citizens to adopt the document nonetheless because it could be changed. So he saw Article 5 as really the linchpin of this new constitutional order. And so we argue that this is really a forgotten element of our constitutional story, that Washington said there was this middle way the Constitution should be binding on all until it's changed by what he said, quote, 
an explicit and authentic act of the I have people. a feeling he's going to quote it exactly. Well, <laughs> he, he's quoting exactly, oh. but I happened to be in Philadelphia with my grandson two weekends ago to show him Independence Hall, and I wasn't there for the Phillies or the Eagles. <laughs> uh, but, you know, not only did we always quote this line, but it was that is the thing that is emblazoned on the wall in that room where they have all the, you know, the statues of all the founders and the new Constitution Center there. What they have in the wall is, I do not think that we are, by Washington, I do not think that we are more inspired, have more wisdom, or possess more virtue than those who will come after us. And that is why we talk about this vision and moderation and common sense and respect that Washington had for future generations it's, and the need to change. It's pretty remarkable. To, I, I think if Washington came back today, and maybe even James Madison, who was even more conservative on amendment questions, he thought that it should be very rarely changed. Jefferson was kind of the other extreme, he said a lot. I think if they came back today, they would be shocked it, that we have amended the Constitution so infrequently. It's clear when you're looking at the work of the 1787 Convention, when you're reading the historical record, it's clear that the, the, frame, the framers and the founding generation saw constitutions as documents that would change with time, that they were both you know, a, a fundamental law that they were settled, that the, that the people could control their government through the document, but that the people could also reform that order. And it's interesting, you know, the last constitutional amendment that was ratified was the year I was born. So my generation, for all intents and purposes, has never had their mark on our constitutional order, and it's possible that they never will if we don't pursue this kind of reform. Even dollying back a little bit from the specific question of Article 5, as I was reading this history and the fact that that's, you know, that's what they have in the hall and that's the, 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 that's the caveat with which Washington was willing to sign, that the so-called textualists, originalists, only pay attention to the text but not to the intention or the, do you know what I'm saying? That, the, that the, they hold it as a sacred, complete document when in fact the people who wrote it, if you are true to the founder's principles, it's a very different stance, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, people like to pretend that they're being true to the founders when they create this originalism notion that they're gonna figure out what the founders intended. Guess what, the founders weren't originalists. <laughs> this is what we're saying. They yeah. understood that times change. They wrote language like, cruel and unusual punishment is, is prohibited in the Eighth Amendment. They could have said, you know, no stocks, no whipping people. They didn't. They said cruel and unusual punishment with a clear understanding that that would be regarded in different ways in different times. So it's selling these brilliant people short to suggest that they would only want a cramped and cabin meaning of their language. That's not who they were. They were a lot smarter than that. Yeah. I think, it, yeah, it doesn't respect the ones you claim to venerate. Right, That's and right. I think the other well, thing so. is, is and, and this <laughs> is that second jeopardy we talk about. You know, there's twin jeopardies, we argue. One is this contemporary threat. But the other jeopardy inherent to Article 5 is that it's created a whole culture of, of constitutionalism in America today where people have really uh, forgotten this fundamental power. We assume instinctively that the only people that can really speak to constitutional matters are judges and lawyers and academics. And we litigate these constitutional questions. And we're not saying that there isn't a role for the courts in, in a you know, functioning constitutional democracy, but the balance is way off. Uh, and and we, the, the only way we can really reclaim this founding conception of constitutionalism is to relook at Article 5. I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning that Article 5 was the first attempt in world history to create a, an amendment mechanism that wasn't premised on unanimity. I mean, it's not surprising to think that the first attempt in world history maybe got some of the, some of the procedure wrong. And, and uh, you know, two, decade, or two, two centuries on, we, we, we need to return to some of these questions. Yeah, you, you, you guys are more expert on this than I, but I, I, I find myself saying that while we may be the oldest written you know, constitution of our sort, no one has copied us exactly. <laughs> no. You know, and, and, and that's always, that second part is always left out when people talk about. You know, it's, it's kind of, there's, there's some today who argue that we should just get rid of constitutionalism at all. Pursue a more uh, 
uh, majoritarian or parliamentary form of government, kind of um, uh, like some European countries, and that we should get rid of this kind of American notion of fundamental law. And we really dispute that claim. We think that you know constitutions are important. Fundamental law as fundamental is exceptionally important. It, it puts uh, guardrails on government, it controls the political process in ways that uh, protects the country, protects the, the polis, and also protects rights, and especially minority rights. Um, but there needs to be some give, uh, uh, because if the, if the Constitution's too brittle, it might break. Um, you quoted Santorum. We've talked a bit about the rights efforts and their, you know, to keep it kind of under wraps and so on. Tell us just a little bit more about their campaign. For instance, who's behind it both um, uh, theoretically, I think Alec and folks like that, and then financially, people like Koch and folks like that. Talk a little bit about what that campaign looks like. Well, you know, that's a crucial point. The Koch brothers are doing this, the Mercers and others, and, and so if anybody thinks, well, here's another thing to worry about, it's not another thing. It's the same thing. They're trying to gut our democracy. You know that. They're, they're, they're damaging the Supreme Court. They're going to try to create an absurd notion that the state legislature can decide who won the presidential election. They, many of these same people, John Eastman from Orange County here, was behind January 6th, and he's one of the key players on this thing. It's the same people. And now this week, The Guardian uh, had a major article talking about our book. It's about Bannon now is adopting this. Bannon has interviewed this Mark Meckler, who's the head of the Convention of the States, and he began by saying, well, it's a sign these guys aren't doing very well who are criticizing it, because all they got is Russ Feingold. So, you know, <laughs> sort of honored to have Bannon take a shot at me. But all, all kidding aside, I don't need to tell you who these people are, and they are all part of the same effort. It's all these household names now, these names that are now household names, but three years ago, before January 6th, you never would have heard of. John Eastman, Jenna Ellis. She was at that mock convention in, in 2016 and wrote articles about it. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of this, this far-right establishment, and it's, been a, it's become a tenet. And you have leading politicians that are endorsing the movement. And so that's really the, the, the cause, one of the causes for concern. It's a truth that's being written now, that if you are of this certain uh, political uh, for ilk, you must endorse this. It's just kind of on tell, the tell agenda. Tell the Cheney story. Oh, so I, this fascinating. He noticed this. On this the fascinating. I was on Twitter. I was watching a video from a a, a, a rally in an anti Liz Cheney rally, and in in Wyoming, and I was just surprised, shocked really. Every single person in the video had on a, pin, a lapel pin in favor of a constitutional convention. I mean, it was just it was it was eerie because you saw in this short 30 second clip all of these, these efforts swimming together. Uh, and it really, it's the same people, it's the same funders, and, and also it's kind of the same intellectual uh, uh, frame and even some of the kind of s the similar intellectuals, the John Eastman's the, the, uh, of the world. Well, I mean, if, if you looked at January 6th as uh, Trump, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and you said, okay, that's the crazy faction, That'd be one thing. But when you look at the flurry of decisions that the Supreme Court did, where they went against the, uh, the American majority on church and state, guns, environmental protection, the climate crisis, and women's rights all within two weeks, I think whatever you thought the likelihood of this happening before and the danger must have escalated enormously when you saw those two weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's the sad part about this. Those of us who believe there were guardrails for this democracy and that certain things would never be done, like refusing to let the President of the United States fill a Supreme Court seat when President Obama was denied, these are the things we didn't think were possible. But anybody who thinks that these folks aren't capable of anything now is a fool. Uh, they are ruthless, and I hate to say it. It's well, not I the way I used to talk about people, but I have to say... I do not believe there is a limit to what they'll do. What do you think about the um, state legislature, uh, the, the, the one independent that's... State the independent state legislature theory? The independent state legislature theory, which we know the Supreme Court is going to take up. What, what are you guys thinking? 
I mean, it's just madness because there, nobody has ever thought that that language, there is language in the Constitution that gives that certain authority to that the way. state legislature if you wanted to have a bizarre interpretation. I mean, these are the same people that say, because it doesn't say in the First Amendment that there shall be a separation of church and state, there is no requirement of church, church and state. So these are the word games that they're playing. And this one is, is utterly bogus, but yet we have at least four Supreme Court justices who seem that, to be somewhat sympathetic to it. And, and for anyone, please just tell people, for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about. So there's a, there's a, 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 a case before the court next term uh, where it has been posited that uh, the Constitution provides that state legislatures are the ultimate guardians of, of their state's electoral votes. And thus, uh, if, the state if the state legislature decides on whatever terms to put, throw out the popular vote, that the state legislature can submit its own s slate of electors. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, uh, it's a similar idea to kind of what was happening on January 6th about these arguments around the power of state legislatures around the uh, electoral balloting procedures. And note that it isn't states' rights. It's state They're saying the governor doesn't get to have anything to do with it. Supreme They're Court? saying if the Supreme Court of California says that Joe Biden won the state, that doesn't have anything to do with it. So this is, this is, again, a true scam from a legal point of view, in my, my opinion. And, and we, we have no idea. But again, th those two weeks in, in, in June make me much yeah. more frightened than I was before them. And they're already back at it in this term. Yeah. So um, leaving aside the problems of a convention, the, 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 what, as you say, the Constitution needs to be updated. There's no question. The Electoral College, we've had two presidents in the last 20 years, right, that, that were not elected by popular vote. Things like that. It, there's got to be change, but amendments are almost impossible. The convention is too unpredictable. What are your solutions? Well, we think that there has to be a commission, a bipartisan commission created that would propose changes and that those changes would have to be go through the congressional route. Because if you go through the convention route, as we say, anything can happen. And so we would like to see Congress, uh, hopefully, obviously, it would have to be a bipartisan group, propose changes both to the way that Congress does its amending process and to the convention process itself. And we've seen examples of this. I mean, oh, uh, good. Uh, well, uh, not on, unfortunately, not yet on Article 5. I'm just thinking about the, the, the bipartisan work to reform the Electoral Count Act, which was that you know, old, old, very old piece of legislation that got newfound life on January 6th, where all these new claims were being made about we can object to the state, the, 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 legis the, the slates and everything. And we argue that this is similar. Uh, it's an old text that now uh, is being read with a new eye, and there's new life being read into it that's really, you know, has no foundation in history in the study of the document, or in our legal tradition, uh, or in the law. And so we think that there hopefully is appetite for this, and the, the idea would be to uh, craft a reform proposal that really uh, answers some of these questions about the convention mechanism itself, and also makes Article Five fundamentally democratic. Uh, it, to the Constitution today in the 21st century should make the opening invocation, we the people, real. It should have a lived salience in our law and in our political life. And that can really only happen fundamentally by changing Article 5. To give two specific examples of what, what we would actually propose, we would have a, an amendment would have to be uh, ratified by, or approved by two-thirds, or a majority of the states, but it would have to be by a popular vote in the state and then by a popular vote in the whole country. So we're not in favor of just a pure national vote because of, it's pure majoritarian. So we would make it easier, but not too easy. And then uh, in terms of the congressional votes, maybe a little bit lower standard than two thirds in both houses. I mean, it would still probably be three quarters for ratification. Uh, and then as Peter was suggesting, with regard to the conventions, Congress would be empowered to say, this is how you count an application this is how the delegates will be chosen. This is how the voting will be done. And so, that it, so that there are, as Peter says, there are no rules. So there are some rules. But th th 
help me with that just in terms of the, the legal way that works. In other words, right now, the convention would make its own rules, and that's part of the, right, or might appears. be able to, and, and, and I think you folks read the Constitution as saying Congress couldn't make them. Under the current Article 5. But if they amend Article 5, and then it goes through an amendment process. Right. Three-fourths of the states. And it would go through the old-fashioned right. amendment process That's right. if it was proposing right. a revised right. one. It's a high bar. Yeah. It's a high bar. But the people of the country would have to decide they have to be able to change their constitution. Yeah. And okay. it would require a real, uh, a, a real concerted debate about the role of the Constitution in modern life. But we think that's a debate we need to have. And it needs to focus on this mechanism. Because this, as George Washington argued, it really is the cornerstone. Without a, a functioning amendment mechanism, the whole system starts to not work too well. I think people today almost have a visceral understanding that our constitutional system both is in peril, but also maybe isn't working too well. And uh, we argued that that really is a feeling that's grounded in this amendment process. The, because the, for all for all intents and purposes, the Constitution has been sitting without really any modern uh, uh, elaboration. For and at this least. moment when people uh, are skeptical about government, it turns out they're perhaps even more skeptical about the Supreme Court, and it seems like that sort of says maybe it's time to look at the Constitution. I mean, it, it seems to me the skepticism about the Supreme Court is a, is a good yeah. entree into this conversation. Yeah, the, peop the people should have a chance to amend their Constitution. The Supreme Court shouldn't be the only people that should be able to do it, and th that was never the intent. And yes, John Marshall said that you know the, they could strike down acts of Congress if, if it was inconsistent with the Constitution, but the founders never intended that the Supreme mechanism for interpreting and changing the Constitution. Yeah, and we, uh, we, this is what we argue in the in the in the second part of the book, the second Jeopardy, is that there's been a new culture, as I said before, where people's understanding of Constitution really has been warped to think of the Supreme Court as the sole arbiter of meaning. Uh, and in a lot of ways, it's been out of necessity. With an Article Five that's so hard to use, I mean, constitutions have to change, otherwise the, the, the document becomes nothing more than a piece of paper. And so we've relied on the courts too much, uh, and, and we need to have some deep debate about that. Very good. Um, I think it's time to open up to questions, although I have one question, which if you don't know the answer to, that's fine. How many members of the Constitutional Convention were lawyers? Oh, geez, almost every one of them. A lot of them. A lot of them. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, so some of them were farmers and generals George Washington things, was not a lawyer. But most of them were lawyers, right? Right. I don't know the exact number. But, but yeah. it was, okay. So I it, don't it, think Franklin it, was either. <laughs> well, even even lawyer then, you know, it was a bit different, right? Yes. Maybe you had read law. It was much a very different kind James of James Madison was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Ted. I share your concern about having a constitutional convention, um, but you talk about a partisan. I'm sorry. A little louder then. But you suggest, oh, there we go, <laughs> uh, that maybe we can have a, par a bipartisan effort in Congress to make these changes. That's not a world that I think I'm living in that, that makes that any more reliable. Perhaps it's less reliable than having a convention itself. What makes you think that that's a practical solution? Well, first of all, um, that's not the world you're living in right now. We don't suggest that the support would be there to do it right now. I strongly disagree with the idea that we might as well have a convention <laughs> because <laughs> the way these guys are going to set it up is just about everything you probably hold dear in the Constitution is going to be threatened. So if it, all we can do at this point is to stop the convention now until people wake up, and say, let's fix this mechanism so the people can change the Constitution, then we should at least do that. But as we've said, in the long term, that's not going to work. And so that's bipartisanship has to return in this country. If it doesn't, we're done. One party running the show will never make a nation. And so the, one of the best ways for this country to come together would be to figure out a better way for us to fix the Constitution. And just to, to clarify, the, the convention, and we didn't really talk about this much, but one of the big um, 
claims that this current movement is making that really has no foundation in law is that a convention can be limited, meaning state legislatures can tell the convention you know, what they can debate and what they can vote on. That argument has really no grounding in law, but nonetheless they make the claim. So a convention is truly a Pandora's box. They can draft any, any amendment they want, much like Congress could in theory. Um, but what we're proposing is a bipartisan commission to draft an amendment to change Article 5. So we're not proposing that Congress should only be the mechanism to change the Constitution. Uh, to the contrary, I mean, I think we would say that under the right conditions and with the appropriate guardrails and settled procedures and rules, a constitutional convention could be a good thing, uh, just not with this current environment and not with this vast void of legal uncertainty into which are flooding all of these crazy new theories. And so your thought is that thing that you, you said before of amending Article 5 as a prerequisite for the ability to hold a legitimate convention. I mean, it's a bit wonky, but it's really the only no. way for it because if you don't settle these questions constitutionally, you can never really answer them. Uh, I mean, a con we argue that the convention can't be regulated by Congress. I mean, it's clear that the intention of the framers was that the convention was really a second route. It was intended for the people from the bottom up to change the constitutional order, whereas Congress was to going from the top down, which kind of makes sense. And in theory, is a good design. Um, so it really, it makes no sense to think that Congress would be able to regulate this mechanism that was meant to check their own power. You're yeah, right, it's a prerequisite. Yeah, let, let me also, I, one thing I, I had meant to do was that uh, I, I had interviewed in the last few years some people who favored the convention, progressives who favored the convention. And so I'm gonna quote from uh, Lawrence Lessig and then Stephen Hill. Lawrence Lessig, the Harvard Law professor, founder of Equal Citizens, founder of Creative Commons and so on. He said, I support an Article 5 convention which would initiate a process not controlled by Congress for proposing amendments to the Constitution. I don't think the convention should act on its own. Instead, if the politician-driven process of proposing amendments could take place alongside a citizen-driven shadow convention, uh, an ambitious set of deliberative polls or something, simultaneously, that kind of representation could work. I don't think that that would work under this current system. I mean, I respect and know Professor Lessig, and he came up with these thoughts uh, in a very effective way, but before the modern era of crazy partisanship and of this kind of thing. So we're going to be up in his neck of the woods in the next week That's and talk right. to him about it, and uh, with uh, Professor Levinson, who's one of the leaders on this. I think, uh, and, and we were with a, a colleague who's written a book about proposed amendments who no longer thinks that it's a good idea to do it now. He wants those amendments, but he doesn't want to do it by virtue of a uh, convention that would be so tilted toward extreme right-wing uh, influences. Then the other, Stephen Hill, who's one of the founders of Fair Vote, and he, he, he writes now at Democracy SOS and so on. He, and, and this is what, what was interesting once I read your book and, 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 and spoke to you about this offline, um, Article 5 is vague, but most constitutional law experts, he says, generally agree that Congress would step up to fill in the details. <laughs> and you guys say, yeah, if it was through an amendment, if they amended Article 5, but right. otherwise they can't There's do no it. There's no authority. They As don't I just said, it, it really, I, I, it doesn't make much sense that Congress could do this because it's clear, well, one, there is no certain answer, I should say that. But if you read the records of the convention and you think about how the, the mechanism was actually drafted, it's clear that this convention was intended to be able to check Congress. This is the ground up one. Exactly, a top down, top down and a bottom up. And so, it, again, it really just doesn't make much sense to think that Congress would be able to put rules on this. Uh, we argue that the, the convention is its own distinct freestanding constitutional body. And like any legal entity, it would be allowed to set its own rules of procedure. Scary. <laughs> Incredibly scary. Next. Any of the uh, solutions that you propose require bipartisanship. And presently, the thinking of Congress is winning. All the focus is on winning. What has to change in their beliefs to change our representatives' 
focus from winning for their party to winning for the country. The country and I see no progress in that direction at well, all. I, I see some, and the name of it is Liz Cheney. She gave up her seat in the House to stand up for the rule of law with Democrats. That is a sign that some people, I mean, look, can you imagine how what a fan of Dick Cheney I was? I was not. <laughs> uh, but here's somebody who, whatever else she may think, has decided that it is time to protect the democracy and the rule of law. And of course, many Democrats are doing that too. So there is a hint there that maybe people are a little concerned and unhappy about the fact that we have people that revel in the idea of a constitutional crisis. So look, I, you know I started off this whole conversation saying what, how different it is now. But I see signs, little signs of hope, and she said today that if uh, Trump is the nominee again, that there'll be a new conservative party. And that conservative party may decide to go back to a conservative principle, which is does not, the conservative principles do not prohibit bipartisanship. They often include bipartisanship. The, did it already happen, I, I'm just not sure of, of the stage uh, of progress we're in, but the um, legislating to clean up the vote counting. That hasn't been passed yet. That would, you but, mean but that has, it, that it, has bipartisan, electoral, some place, yeah, that has bi Senator McConnell has even said he supports it. So you mean for the electoral college? Yes, tell yes. people what we're talking well, that, about. This it is hasn't I, happened yet. Because it would be an example of bipartisanship. Right, and this yes. is what I said before, it's this, it's Count Act. It's this, um, and this attempt where you've, you've gotten Republicans and Democrats of stature, uh, um, uh, Senator McConnell, uh, to say, look, this is an old document, this old piece of legislation, it needs reform. Because if we don't reform it, bad things are going to occur. And in a lot of ways, Article 5 is similar. And interestingly enough, think of all the people that were theorizing new ways of thinking about the Electoral Count Act. John Eastman, Jenna Ellis, I mean, it's the same cast of characters. They have love for these old legal texts and breathing new life into them uh, and totally changing you know, th their, their meaning. And so we would say that there is, a, a hopefully, some appetite. Is that expected to pass? Yes. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. But, but let me be fair to the, the questioner here. I mean, the, the reality is it is going to be exceedingly hard. So our answer is stop the convention. Okay, that, if you can't do it, uh, if, if you can't get bipartisanship on this, so be it. So it's, it's a two-step process, and the second step probably will take a while, but I think ultimately it'll be necessary. This is one of those, this is a generational. This is not probably a, this is not a, uh, by the a, way, a, a term of office thing. Almost this is all our constitutional amendments have been over generations. You right. know, the uh, women's right to vote, the, Prohibition took generations. Right. Took, didn't take long to get rid of it. Uh, but uh, it takes a long time to, to mount one of these things. And that's part, you know, we're proposing a, an agenda not for the next electoral cycle, not for the next five electoral cycles. We're really proposing, trying to start a conversation about these deeper questions. And of course, they're, they're all grounded in law, so you need to think about how you reform the law. But as I said before, it also we need to have these, these deeper debates and conversations about who we are as a people and you know how is it that you actually do this this process of constitutional amendment because at the end of the day it's the process by which the Declaration of Independence is made alive that the people reform their own government any more questions So, I mean, waiting on Liz Cheney is an exercise in futility. And how do we get to the root cause absent a convention which is getting money out of the political system just like you and Senator McCain did, I don't know, what is it, 15, 20 years now? So that seems to be the root cause. How can we shame Congress into full submission on this matter? You get to that, then you get some real positive change in this country? I don't think there's any shaming this Congress. I don't think that's going to work. John and I were able to succeed at that because in those days, the people helped us. 
We went around the country and people insisted that their elected representatives do this. Things are far more partisan now, but remember, McCain Feingold was bipartisan. That's the only way we were able to do it. So I'm not telling you to wait on Liz Cheney, but I am telling you to wait on trying to get as many people, reasonable people, to come together uh, to do what needs to be done. And, and so uh, you're, you're sort of giving up on the country if you don't try to figure out a way to connect people in this way because you're never going to have the country governed effectively by one party across the long term. It can't be one party rule. So even if we could have everything always be Democrats, uh, which some people would want, um, it wouldn't work. People would be way too frustrated. And, you know, you're going to have Democrat, if things work right, hopefully you'd have either two healthy political parties or another political party. Something has to give because what has happened with the Republican Party was essentially an unfriendly takeover of a party that had, I never agreed with it, of course, but it had right. a distinguished history. And that history was thrown in a trash can by a president and by people who don't even believe in the principles of the Republican Party. You've been talking about it, the danger of, of one party rule. Uh, I'm much more concerned right today of minority rule. Well, that's what and this is. Yeah, this is exactly. This is emblazoning and putting the Constitution forever minority rule by putting it right in the Constitution. Yeah, or reimagining the Constitution. That's this, conven this convention of states logic. Yeah. You know, well, it, the people don't matter too much. It's the states. And that, uh, as we say, just read the first couple of lines of the, the Constitution. It starts, we the people. That's right. That's right. And anyone who, who, who forgets, we live in a state of 40 million and we have the same amount of Senate power as Wyoming, which has 600,000 people. And they would want a convention where California and Wyoming both had one vote. That's right. And, and they have a Senate where... And Article 5 are. only allows you to change... To, one thing can't be changed in Article 5. <laughs> Everything else can. It's equal representation in the Senate. Each state gets the same senators. So it's unless you amend Article 5, you can't change that. Wow. Now, there is some, you know, it's talk about da angels dancing on the head of a pen. Some people argue you could just change Article 5 and remove it. But, yeah. Well, I think we could yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but that means two-thirds is right. all the problem. You know. And our final question for the evening. The Roberts Court has delivered one uh, devastating decision after the next. So my question is, legally, how possible is it for states just to defy to defy the Supreme Court? Well, first of all, it's, I, I don't even call it the Roberts Court anymore. If it was the Roberts Court, I don't think you would have... It's the Alito Court. Yeah, yeah I mean, you would, not, you would have some decisions you wouldn't like. Uh, but, you know, I don't think we certainly... I certainly would not be at the point where encouraging people to defy the Supreme Court. Um, we still need the courts. We still need a legitimate legal system. It would play into the hands of those who would prefer a fascist government in this country to completely destabilize the courts. I'm president of the American Constitution. We advocate judicial reform. We think there should be additional seats on the Supreme Court. We think there should be term limits. We think there should be ethics rules. But our goal is not to figure out a way to get a bunch of left-wingers on the court. Our goal is to return the legitimacy of the court, which has been gutted by the stealing of Supreme Court seats by uh, not playing according to the rules. So uh, no, I can't say that I believe you should defy the Supreme Court, but it isn't really defying. The states can do a lot of stuff to protect these rights. Look what Kansas did. Look what Michigan might do on the right to choose. You can pass constitutional amendments directly. Maybe sometimes you don't like the game that's played. <laughs> we can't do that in Wisconsin. But there's a lot of ways in the interim to assert these rights in a way that I hope will ultimately lead uh, to the Supreme Court coming around. I mean, think about gay marriage. You know, it took a little, very long time, a lot of activism at different state levels before the court finally said, wait a minute, this, the world has changed. We can't have this anymore. We have to make it legal. They might go back. They would do it on this thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.